morning. morning. Welcome to each and every one of you. I know that many of you are here almost every week, and uh, some of you are here just have only been here for a few times. Some of you are coming in over the airwaves, and we're thankful for all of you being with us as we gather in worship because together this worship is so much richer. We are here on the sixth. Sunday after Pentecost. The Spirit is still with us. We are thankful for that and we continue on our sermon series of, um, about Proverbs, always wear sunscreen, and today Reverend Jean will speak about the reward of wisdom. So a good message that will be shared this morning. Let us begin our worship as we join together in our call to worship. It is in your bulletin and behind me on the screen. Lift up the gates of your soul, open the closed doors of your mind, that the King of glory may come in. Who is this King of glory? God counts souls. This is the King of glory. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who in Christ has blessed us with every spiritual blessing that is available throughout the Let us pray together. God, for everything there is a time, and time is now our most precious commodity. Our clocks are always running. Slow us down, Lord, and for now simply remind us that only one thing is needful, that we be still before you and know that you are God. I invite you to stand as you are able as we join together in our opening hymn, O God, Our Help in Ages Past. Those of you who are using your hymnal, please note we're singing verses 1, 4, 5, and 6. Please rise. <laughs>
morning. Our scripture reading this morning is Ephesians 1, 17 through 23. This part of scripture is in the form of a prayer that Paul is writing to the Ephesians, uh, but it addresses us as well as we're included in it as saints. Uh, it's written to expand the horizons of us so that we might better understand the dimensions of God's eternal purpose and grace. Listen to the word of God. I pray that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, will give you a spirit of wisdom and revelation that makes God known to you. I pray that the eyes of your heart will have enough light to see what is the hope of God's call, what is the richness of God's glorious inheritance among the believers, and what is the, the overwhelming greatness of God's power that is working among, among us believers. This power is conferred by the energy of God's powerful strength. God's power was at work in Christ when God raised him from the dead and sat him at God's right hand, actually beside in the heavens, <clears throat> far above every ruler and authority and power and angelic power, any power that might be named, not only now, but in the future. God put everything under Christ's feet and made him head of everything in the church, which is his body. His body in the church is the fullness of Christ, who fills everything in every way. This is the word of God for the people of God.
comes through your Son, Jesus Christ. We thank you for the wisdom that comes as we come to know who Jesus Christ is and for the opportunity to follow him in your church. Holy God, we give back these our gifts in gratitude for all the gifts you give to us. The gifts of wisdom, the gift of revelation, the gift of your Son. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.
Lord, be with every child who comes this week through our doors, that they may feel and see and hear of you and your love. We pray all these things in your son's name. Amen.
Wisdom will enter your mind and knowledge will fill you with delight. Discretion will guard you. Understanding will protect you. Wisdom will rescue you from the evil path, from people who twist their words. They forsake the way of integrity and go on obscure paths. They enjoy doing evil, rejoicing in their twisted evil. Their paths are confused. They get lost on their way. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. The faculty of a college had gathered for their beginning of the semester faculty meeting when suddenly an angel appeared and turned to the dean. The angel said, I will grant you one of three choices. Infinite wisdom, infinite wealth, or infinite health. The dean thought for a moment, and like the good dean he is, said, Wisdom, so be it. And the angel disappeared. In the silence that followed, the dean sat thoughtfully, saying nothing and staring off into the distance. And finally, one of the other faculty members exclaimed, Do you have anything to say? What words of wisdom can you give us? And the dean replied, I should have taken the money. <laughs> Every day, we make choices. On the job, at school, at home, at work. Will I get up and go to work and school today? Or do I call in sick and play hooky? Will I lie to save my own skin? When someone insults me, puts me down, or hurts me, how will I react? When I am tempted to do something that sounds fun, but might have negative consequences, what will I do? How should I handle money? How much do I save? Where should I spend it? Will I help my friend even though I was really looking forward to watching the game? Each choice we have, each choice we make, has consequences, whether good or bad. Some results we see right away, some results we may never see for years, decades, or even a lifetime. For instance, I could choose to eat a salad for lunch today, and it probably wouldn't have much impact on my overall health. But, if I keep eating healthier meals and smaller portions and more vegetables, then I might lose that weight I've been trying to lose for the last 10 years. And it will help me maintain good health over time. Likewise, I could have a Big Mac, the supersized fries and Coke at McDonald's for lunch today. And it probably wouldn't have any dire consequences today or tomorrow. But supposing I eat this meal at least four or five times a week for the next several months, eventually it will lead to obesity, high blood pressure, high cholesterol, and possibly a heart attack. Choices. You're probably familiar with the verse in the Bible out of Galatians which says, You reap what you sow makes a great cross-stitch sampler, doesn't it? Which means if you are planting bad choices, you will eventually see bad consequences. And if you make good choices, you will eventually see good consequences. The choices we make do make a difference. There is a word for being able to make the right decision every time. The word is wisdom. Webster's Dictionary defines wisdom as having the knowledge of what is true or right coupled with good judgment. In other words, according to Webster, a wise person is one who knows what is true and right and then is able to make the right decision. Wisdom should not be confused with knowledge.
knowledge, though, or common sense. Knowledge you can pick up at a book, or you can take a class, or you can get it by watching HGTV. A person who is wise has nothing to do with how smart they are, or what kind of grades they get in school, or what kind of job they have. Some of the smartest people make the dumbest choices because they lack wisdom. Here's a story to illustrate this point. It was in a, the, the Reuters News Agency reported this several years ago, but I found it and I think it works well. A Massachusetts doctor and Harvard graduate has been suspended for leaving a patient on the operating table midway through spinal surgery so he could deposit a check at his local bank. Right? Okay. The State Board of Medicine that David Arndt, an orthopedic surgeon, posed, quote, an immediate threat to the public health, safety, and welfare after he left the patient last month with an open incision in his back. According to Reuters, Arndt left behind a surgeon who was not qualified to complete the surgery. After his 35-minute trip to the bank, Arndt returned to the operating room and finished the surgery within a few hours. The doctor's license to practice medicine in Massachusetts has been suspended, but he will have a chance to appeal the decision. Arndt, a graduate of Harvard Medical School, was not available for comment on his suspension. I bet not. We probably all know people, smart people, who have made bad choices. Company CEOs, presidents, even pastors. So how does a person gain wisdom so that we consistently make the right choices? As we just read in verse 6, For the Lord gives wisdom, and from his mouth come knowledge and understanding. The Bible tells us God is the source of wisdom. God is the one who helps us make good choices every time. Which makes sense, because God knows everything. God created everything. And God knows the future. God knows the results of every decision we will ever make before we even make it. Even though we also have free will and the ability to make those choices. Unfortunately, we tend to rely on our own understanding and, and our own wisdom. We ask ourselves, does this feel right to me? Does it make me happy? Does it make sense to me? Which may work for us for a while, but eventually if all we rely on is our own wisdom and understanding, we're going to steer ourselves in the wrong direction. Perhaps even make a disastrous choice because we made our decision based on our own limited abilities rather than using God. Using your own judgment alone will cause you at some point to fail morally. Destroy a relationship with a friend or family member because of what you said or did. Will cause you to misuse money. Something will happen. Proverbs 14, 12 says, There is a path before each person that seems right, but it ends in death. That means the decision you make or the path you choose to take may seem like the right one to you in that moment, when in reality it leads to death or a bad consequence. Proverbs 3, 5 through 8 says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Do not depend on your own understanding. Seek his will in all you do, and he will direct your path. Don't be impressed with your own wisdom. Instead, fear the Lord and turn your back on evil. Then you will gain renewed health and vitality. Notice what it said. Don't depend on your own understanding. Don't be impressed with your own wisdom. Rather, seek God's will and God will direct your path. God will point you in the right direction. I don't know about you, but that's hard. For me. That's hard to not 
trust in my own ability, but instead to trust God. How often are we seeking God's wisdom and God's will? How often do we rely on our own limited understanding rather than relying on God? Do you know what's going to happen tomorrow besides vacation Bible school? No, not really. But God does. Do you know how your choices today are going to impact your future? No, but God does. Why wouldn't we trust in God and seek God's will? So how do we gain God's wisdom? How can we know what the right choice is to make in our life? As we've already discovered, wisdom comes from God. Therefore, we need to seek God by crying out and by searching for God. Our first verses for today said, My child, listen to me and treasure my instructions. Tune your ears to wisdom and concentrate on understanding. Cry. Some translations say call. Cry out for insight and understanding. Wisdom is not an automatic thing. It's not like the angel appearing to the dean and snapping its fingers. We don't just suddenly become wise, even if we become Christians. It is a gift from God which is given to those who pursue it and ask for it. Crying out or calling out for wisdom means we implore God. We ask God. Listen to what Jesus' brother James writes in his letter that we find in our New Testament. If you need wisdom, if you want to know what God wants you to do, ask him, and he will gladly tell you. He will not resent your asking, but when you ask him, be sure that you really expect him to answer. For a doubtful mind is as unsettled as a wave of the sea that is driven and tossed by the wind. People like that should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. Proverbs and James both tell us that we really want God's wisdom and understanding to make the right choices in our life. We have to go to the source. We need to ask God. Asking God is a form of prayer. Lord, what do you want me to do? Asking God isn't just something we do when a big decision comes up, like, what should I do with the rest of my life? Or is it time to retire? Or when should I retire? Or should I take this career or a new job? But in everyday life. One of our earlier passages said, Seek God's will in all you do. When was the last time you asked God to help you make a decision? When was the last time you looked at your daily calendar, your schedule, and asked God, what do you want me to do today? Unfortunately, we tend to run our own life without God's input until after we've blown it. Then we want God to bail us out. Fortunately, God is loving and kind and frequently helps us out. But we still face the consequences of our decisions. All too often we don't ask God for God's wisdom until we are at the very end of our rope, or we cannot come up with the solution on our own. It's a last resort. What would happen if we started every day with God instead? If we got up and looked at our calendar and said, God, how can I serve you today? Even in the appointments and meetings, how can I serve you today? Asking may also mean we humble ourselves and seek the advice of wise, godly people. God shares wisdom through other people. In the New Testament of the Bible, we are told that God has given some believers special gifts or spiritual gifts of wisdom or discernment in order that they might help others in their decision making. Maybe you have that gift. 
If we ask and actually listen to these wise people, we may God gain God's insight. I can tell you for almost 100% for me, that is how I gain God's wisdom, is in my conversations with other godly, wise people. We can also seek God's wisdom when we read God's Word, the Bible. We are given God's inspired Word to help guide us in making the right choices and decisions. Unfortunately, for far too many of us, though, the Bible just kind of sits as a coffee table book, collecting dust. Every once in a while we go by and brush it off or dust it. But sometimes we just don't think we have the time to read. Or when we do, we just don't understand it, so why even try? We grow in God's wisdom by, by reading the little nuggets of wisdom God has already given in God's inspired word. This is not just an ancient book of old-fashioned principles that's been on the best-selling list for decades. It is still God's living word, relevant to us today. As we read, read earlier in Proverbs, search for it, that is wisdom and understanding. Search for it as you would for lost money or hidden treasure. The ultimate goal of wisdom, though, is not to gain wisdom. The ultimate goal of wisdom is to know God better. <clears throat> Seeking God's wisdom is not just about getting help to make the right decisions in our life. It is about a deepening relationship with God. Sonny read earlier in Ephesians, I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. While it is good to gain God's wisdom in making good choices, remember that God's best choice for us is to know God better. God actually wants a personal relationship with us. And ultimately, God imparts God's wisdom through the Holy Spirit to those who choose to have a personal relationship with the Trinity through Jesus Christ. The Apostle Paul wanted those early Christians, those Ephesians, to receive more of the spirit of wisdom, not just so they could choose right from wrong or what God's will is, but so they could go deeper with God. That they could have a more personal relationship with God. As we continue in our series on Proverbs, I don't just want us to grow in wisdom for wisdom's sake, but to help us to know God better in order to do God's will. Friends, we all have to take responsibility for all of our own decisions. There are consequences to the choices we make. What I am encouraging you to do is not to wait until things fall apart before you act, before you seek God and God's wisdom, God's direction, God's will, and then to follow God. Even if it goes against your feelings, even if it goes against your logic, because I'm telling you, if logic was ruling here, we would not be taking two little boys under the age of two. We are trusting that this is God's will, and we are stepping out in faith. God will never steer you wrong. Thanks be to God.
Thanks for loving us and showing us the path to life, the path to life abundant. Lord, forgive us when we choose to ignore your truth. And instead, we get lost on our own path, the path that leads to destruction. Thank you that your grace and your forgiveness are there for us even when we make bad choices. Even when life on this earth has led us astray. Help us, Lord, to follow you, knowing that in you our reward will be a relationship with you. Knowing you better and relationships with others that are filled with love, with trust, with integrity and righteousness, and yes, even filled with a peace that is beyond our own understanding. Lord, we pray for those who have lost those that they love. And in so, in that life circumstance, it has led to grief. And this morning we pray especially for the families of Tommy Tompkins and Ralph Johnson as they were both laid to rest yesterday. One here in Bella Vista and one in North Carolina. We ask that these families may see your strength and comfort, that their reward will be a new trust, a new hope, and ultimately that peace that only you can provide. We pray with those who are facing health concerns and concerns for life circumstances. This morning we especially lift up Jeanette Horner, Gary Grossnickel, and Blake Gross. We ask that your healing touch be with them in both body and spirit, that their reward will be a new knowledge that you indeed provide and protect us in all circumstances. And Lord, this morning especially, we give you thanks for children, for the joy, the excitement, the promise that comes with young ones who are just little sponges waiting to absorb your, your goodness. We ask for your blessings on the children who will attend our vacation Bible school this week. That they indeed will come to know your joy and your love and they will have a lot of fun in the happening. Lord, we give you thanks for new babies, especially for the two baby boys who have been waiting, one for almost two years and the other for eight months, waiting to be adopted, waiting for a forever family, a family who loves them, protects them, and nurtures them, and will do so throughout their lives. Lord, these two little boys will be joining the family of Reverend Jean and he. They will have a forever mommy and a daddy, and they will have a big sister in Natalie. Lord, may this family know their reward in your blessing in their lives. That they will be a family that grows not just in number, so much more importantly, that they grow in your love, in your wisdom, in your understanding, in the richness of their lives, and the completeness of their lives. Lord, we give you thanks this morning for all the reward of your blessings. And we join our voices as one, as we say together the prayer which Jesus taught us, our Father.
temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Well, I am full of all kinds of announcements today. Um, I have another on behalf of our Staff Pastor Parish Relations Committee that um, our worship leaders, Shannon Wicker and Garrett Greer, um, have uh, decided that it's time they need to move on from their leadership position in our contemporary worship service. Um, we wanted to tell you all because they've been around for a while. Um, 13 years for Shannon, she has led service, but before that she was, like many of you, a pew sitter and participant in worship, and Garrett has been here for 11 years, and on August 11th will be their last Sunday, and we're going to have a cake and card reception for them right before this service, um, at the end of the conclusion of the second service, and so you are invited to come and celebrate their ministry with us. Um, they both have different reasons for um, needing to move on, and between them they decided that they were going to do it at the same time, and I kind of was not, that scared me. Um, <laughs> we'll put it that, that way, but uh, anyway, we do wish them well. Uh, we do have some candidates, and we will be finalizing um, those, uh, re the new leader, in the next several days. So look for that announcement as well. Your invitation to discipleship today um, is to continue to pray for our Vacation Bible School that happens beginning tonight, um, and then to also come. Um, what better way to see God's wisdom being imparted than to, to our little seeds and putting those little seeds then to come and see for yourself of course, um, you know that the whole church gets transformed, and this year our theme is Tomorrow's and Beyond. Um, I believe Cokesbury, the publisher, had the 50th anniversary of the moon landing in their mind, um, and so that's what our, our, our lobby, our narthex, in the last uh, week has transformed into some of that. And so I hope you will come this week and enjoy a few moments with the children and, and look around. But to most importantly, to keep them in your prayers and to keep our leaders in your prayers as well. I invite you to stand as you are able for our closing hymn, Blessed Assurance. <coughs>
coffee? Awesome. Thank you, Casey. I got a little worried for us there for a second. <laughs> okay, good. So go have coffee and, and pastries uh, before you head to lunch. That is still good. Brothers and sisters, go forth being secured, being assured in God's love and in God's wisdom. And then share that love and wisdom with all whom you meet this week. In the name of our Creator, Redeemer, and Sustainer, that all God's children say, Amen. Amen. Do you want to do this? Yes. You should stop on them. Yeah. Two.